Uh, blinking light. I don't know if that's bad. You're not my supervisor. All right, I have a green light, so I'm going to start talking now. Uh, my name is Matthias Palmersheim. Today I'm going to be talking to you about easy mode monitoring and logging with Shiftmon. Before we get into that, who am I? By profession and hobby, I am a Linux nerd and site reliability engineer. And if I don't have enough fun uh, setting up servers during the workday, I go home and do it. And I also like pretty charts. Um, data visualization can be really helpful when you're talking to people who aren't as involved in an issue or less technical like a manager. I like to joke that managers speak in dashboards and pretty graphs. So can really help with understanding. And sometimes they just look cool. Um, I'm also extremely lazy. My attitude toward engineering is that it's working really hard to be lazy. Uh, the anecdote I have for that is some guy got really sick of swimming across a river, so he invented a boat. And then some guy got really tired of rowing and just wanted to walk across, so he made a bridge. And that's kind of how I think about things, is working really hard to be lazy. So I do this. Um, there's two primary reasons for doing this. One is I wanted notification when Ansible pull jobs failed. So in my home lab, I use Ansible pull and system D services to configure most of my infrastructure, and I just wanted to push notification to my phone when that failed. I figured, hey, it shouldn't be that hard to figure out. And three years later, I have a full observability stack set up. Um, also, in 2018, 2019, I was working as an IT manager, and I had no budget for monitoring and no monitoring setup. So I spent a ton of time working with existing open source tools. Uh, they weren't exactly put together the best, and they had templates. Uh, that would send like five alerts out if I rebooted a Windows server because the service name had a weird string of letters and a whole bunch of other stuff. Uh, I ended up giving myself something called alert fatigue, which is where you get like 200 notifications and you just ignore all of them because there's so many of them, you stop caring and you miss the important one. Um, the other reason why I wanted this solution was that every job I've been at, monitoring and logging hasn't been the best, and I've noticed that among my colleagues as well. So if I have something that's open source and easy to deploy, it's pretty easy to take to work with me as well. But why not just send all the data off to the cloud? Um, there's a bunch of really good cloud monitoring solutions out there. Uh, it fixes the problem of you don't have to manage monitoring infrastructure, so you don't have to worry about scaling out. You don't have to worry about configuring a whole bunch of dashboards and alert templates. Um, it also fixes a problem known as who watches the watcher, which in this context is you have monitoring infrastructure and you have infrastructure that actually uh, like serves an application. And the closer those two pieces of infrastructure are together, the more likely is a change in one can affect the other. And you could take both out simultaneously. And that means you don't know that it's broken because it wasn't able to notify you that it is broken because it's either turned off or in some sort of failed state. Um, also, a lot of those solutions have a bunch of pre-configured alerts, integrations, dashboards, and some documentation that can help you. But kind of a mixed bag is uh, something I like to call credit card scaling. So most people here, I'm assuming, have like left some infrastructure on in a public cloud and then gotten the bill and been like, oh, God. Um, in some use cases, that's really good. Say you're at a startup where your goal is to just get really big, really fast, and I don't really care about how much it costs. Credit card scaling is a really good thing. If you're me as an IT manager, I would much rather have a server fall over than hit a credit limit or have to explain to my boss, yeah, we spent like 10 times as much as we were supposed to on monitoring this month. Sorry, dog. Um, 
Another thing is going to be where is my data being sent? So with cloud vendors, you might not know where there's data, how long it's being retained. It could cause compliance issues. And another thing I've noticed with a lot of existing solutions is that uh, going off the beaten path can be difficult. So they'll have like good integrations for really common things, Windows, Linux, maybe a firewall. Uh, but then if you need to instrument like some obscure framework or some custom application you write, it's really difficult. I liken it to uh, growing up in the suburbs. I had sidewalks that would just end randomly and go across the street or the sidewalk would begin on the other side of the street. And that's what it was like. I just get to the end of the sidewalk and be like, oh, I have to go through the dirt or go across the road. And it really wasn't that great. So I wanted something that fixed that. Um, here's an example of credit card scaling from my home lab. Uh, this is based off of Grafana cloud pricing. And basically, the way they bill for metrics data is the number of unique tags in a measurement once a minute. If you log more than once a minute, you get billed a second series. So upper right-hand corner of that dashboard, it is uh, if I was smart and only sending data once a minute, it would be $30 a month based on uh, Grafana Cloud's pricing since it's less than 20,000 series. If I didn't do anything, it would be about $445 a month. And then I turn on NTOP NG. And then the number of series I would be sending to Grafana Cloud would have doubled in this case. And I would have been on the hook for somewhere between one grand to $1,300. So thankfully, this was in my home lab and Victoria Metrics scales out super well. So I didn't even notice like increased resource utilization on my server. And I didn't have to pay $1,300 for a Grafana Cloud bill. So what does Shiftmon do? Uh, Shiftmon is a glue project which basically means I took a whole bunch of really cool open source tools and smacked them all together into one solution. Uh, this solution will take a single Linux virtual machine or bare metal box and turn it into an observability stack. It does this by deploying Victoria metrics for storing, for storing metrics, uh, Grafana Loki for storing logs, and then it will also deploy Grafana with a bunch of dashboards pre-populated. It will also do the same thing for Telegraph. And that's kind of the big value add here is that installing Telegraph or installing Grafana or any one of these tools individually isn't that hard. But getting configs that are efficient and not sending a bunch of useless data or making Grafana dashboards or having documentation for adding alerts, that is where a lot of the difficulty comes in. And this will do a bunch of that for you. Uh, optionally, you can deploy uptime Kuma if you need uh, small scale black box monitoring checks, so things like an HTTP request or anything uh, like a ping, something like that. And then Grafana on call if you need to send a heartbeat out to Grafana Cloud to make sure your stuff's still running, or if you have complicated notification preferences, like if this person doesn't answer for 20 minutes, notify this person or uh, notify everybody. So, what does it all monitor? Um, it has basic templates for both Linux, Windows, and PFSense and OpenSense. Uh, along with that, it will detect for HTTP servers. So if, you ha if it detects that Nginx or HTTPD is installed by looking for a systemd service, it will uh, look for the default logging locations. If you're using Caddy or Trafic, it will use the Prometheus metrics for Caddy or the uh, InfluxDB integration with Trafic. So you can get all the data from that. For hypervisors, right now, you can send data from Proxmox, or uh, you can scrape the API for VMware vSphere. And it also uses the Telegraph plugin for Libvirt. And uh, recently, this week, we also landed support for NTOPNG. So if you have NTOPNG set up, you can set the InfluxDB database uh, for that, and it will send data there with a pretty pre-populated dashboard. But that's not all it does. You can also use it for whatever you have. So if you do have a custom application, you can add data here. And the rule of thumb is if automation isn't touching it, it's fair game. Uh, Telegraph has a couple hundred supported input plugins right now and a bunch of output plugins. And I can even track non-technical things. So something that's getting really popular with uh, the Grafana stack is monitoring non-technical things. The only example I have of this 
uh, that doesn't have personal information is how much money I'm losing on cryptocurrency at the moment, which right now is a lot. <laughs> if there was anything going up, I swear it would be green. <laughs> um, so not only can it monitor non or, uh, all your infrastructure data, but it can monitor non-technical data as well. So what's gluing this all together? For deployment, we're using Ansible. The reason I chose Ansible along with, I had a few years of experience with it prior to starting this, is that it's agentless, so you don't have to set up a complicated client server infrastructure like Puppet or Chef. It also doesn't store state like Terraform. Uh, so it's very easy to get up and running with it. It's widely used, so it's something that most people will, will have heard of at least, even if they haven't used it before. The module ecosystem is really cool. Uh, for Docker support, we actually use the Jeff Kierling role, and we have, or we publish all of the content, so all the Ansible roles for deploying Shiftmon and the Telegraph role is published to Ansible Galaxy. So Ansible is a really good fit for this. For the runtime on the server, we're using Docker or Podman. Either one could be used. Uh, you can swap between them, actually. So you do have to manually uninstall it, but if you just change in the Ansible inventory, uh, Docker to Podman or vice versa, it will switch them out. Um, it also makes for really easy updating. All the projects that we use have either a stable or latest tag that we can pull from. Um, and Compose also makes it easy to do things like uh, optionally deploy Telegraph because you're just using a Jinja template to say, hey, if it's supposed to install this, install it. Also, we do have all of the vendor docs linked at the bottom of the slide deck. For data visualization, we're using Grafana. It's actually open source. Uh, something you get into with databases and data visualization is weird source available licenses, and I'm not a huge fan of those. Some of them haven't been legally tested, and it answers a, or it leads to a bunch of weird questions. So it's nice that everything here is an open source license. Uh, it can also view multiple data sources in one dashboard. So some other observability tools I've run into in the wild, you have metrics and logs, but you can't put them together or them very well. So this solution lets you view uh, like metrics and logs from multiple sources all in one dashboard. Uh, there's also a ton of different visualization types. So it doesn't just have boring time series and bar graphs. You have world maps. Uh, we have examples of this later. And it's very automation friendly. So it, for populating with content, you can either use the API or you can just plop a bunch of YAML files on disk and it will pick them up. And then all the app config is in a single any file. Uh, last two reasons why I like Grafana a bunch is it supports a ton of SSO methods. Currently, it can configure Google SSO or LDAP. And then it also has built-in simple alerting. So if you just need to like shoot an email out or notify a Slack channel, uh, Grafana can do that. For sending in the data, we're using Telegraph. Uh, Telegraph has, like I said earlier, a couple hundred input plugins and I think like a couple dozen output plugins. And it's also one agent to rule them all. I gave a lightning talk, I think it was last year or two years ago, where I said Telegraph was one agent to rule them all so you don't have to set up uh, different tools for logs versus metrics. And if there isn't a plugin for something, Telegraph supports a ton of generic protocols. So if you just need to scrape an HTTP API like we do with vSphere, or if your application has um, a Prometheus endpoint, it can ingest that as well. It's very automation friendly and it runs pretty much everywhere. Uh, for metric storage, we're using Victoria metrics. It's extremely easy to deploy and configure. All the options are well documented on their website and it's either done through a command line flag or through environment variables. The cool thing about Victoria metrics is that it supports multiple ingest APIs. So if you're using Telegraph like we are, you can use the InfluxDB output, but it also supports Prometheus Remote Write and Graphite as well if those suit you better. Uh, the query language is metrics QL, which is a superset of uh, the Prometheus query language. And it looks a lot like log QL, which is how uh, you query logs using Grafana Loki, and that's how we're storing logs. So having one 
unified experience for querying metrics and logs is really cool. They're not exactly the same, but they're extremely similar. Um, Loki is also very easy to deploy and configure. It's a single YAML file, and <coughs> Grafana's documentation has gotten really good over the past year. And another nice thing about the log side of this is that it's not relying on syslog for everything. So a lot of observability tools want you to set up like syslog ng or r syslog to forward data, and those tools don't necessarily have the nicest config languages, and they're like they're unique to them, whereas Telegraph uses Toml for the configuration. And the documentation for Telegraph for every plugin is pretty solid. For the optional services, we have Uptime Kuma. So <clears throat> it's extremely easy to use. It supports a ton of notification endpoints if you or someone on your team just needs to know when a website is down and you don't want to go through the Grafana alerting pipeline. Uh, it also supports Prometheus metric scraping if you need to store uh, like what the response time of this application was for a long period of time or you uh, want to go through the Grafana alerts. Some downsides to this tool and why it's optional is that it's one probe in, and it only supports one admin user. So if you need to monitor how your application is performing in various regions, it might make more sense to look into something like Grafana Synthetic Monitoring. Otherwise, you end up managing multiple completely independent instances of Uptime Kuma. Uh, one last downside of it is that it's not automation friendly. So unlike Telegraph, where you just plop a config file in a .d directory, uh, there's no like API or Terraform plugin, anything like that. Last optional tool is Grafana OnCall. Um, there's two main use cases for this. One use case that I like a lot is that you can have it authenticate to a Grafana Cloud instance and solve the who watches the watcher problem. So what Grafana OnCall will do is every few minutes it'll send out a heartbeat to Grafana Cloud, and if the cloud hasn't received a heartbeat, it'll send a notification to my phone. The other cool thing is that it has a dedicated app, so you don't have to figure out uh, if you're using, let's say, like Teams or Slack, how to make it so you can ignore your manager after hours, but you can still get your infrastructure alerts, having the dedicated app makes that much easier. Uh, another cool thing about on-call is that it can manage on-call schedules or more complicated notification preferences. So if you have like a uh, team of first responders or a firefighter, they can answer the call right away, and it can ingest a calendar and keep, all, keep track of all that instead of just, hey, I'm at threshold, send email. So some practical applications of this. These are all from my home lab. Why is the RAM gone? Um, let's see. Yay, demo works. Um, so this dashboard is showing a libvert hypervisor and how much, or how much resources they're using and what resources are available. In this time frame, you can see right here, that I'm using 85% of my memory and I want to deploy some new services and some new applications, but I don't have enough RAM to do so, as you can see here. If we scroll down here, we can also see all the machines running on this hypervisor as well. So I could go through and be like, oh, I don't need this randomly named machine. Uh, in this case, everything was necessary. So I added more RAM. And when I added more RAM, ButterFS started freaking out that the checksum in memory <laughs> um, was different than what was on disk. So I had to go through, uh, since smart data will be automatically collected on bare metal, but it's not hooked into a dashboard, you have to go through a query, which a really cool thing about Grafana with PromQL and Metrics QL, they give you this really neat WYSIWYG editor here where we can go through and get smart, uh, smart, what is it? You can go smart and it'll, what was that? Oh, thank you. Uh, what is that? Control plus? Uh, oh. Uh, I need to find the plus key too. Better? Yeah. So here I s uh, start typing in smart. Is it? Status OK. Uh, device. Maybe. Health OK. There it is. 
So I can go through here, see that all my hard drives were healthy in this case. Um, so I knew that it was actually the memory that I had recently added that was the issue. In this case, it's a simple binary check that's one healthy, zero is bad. Uh, next issue that it helped me figure out was why my Nextcloud server was running too slow. So when I initially deployed my Nextcloud instance, I just put everything in one QCOW2 file and then put it onto my slow spinning Rust di disks. And that led to poor, perform ah, poor performance because uh, I was using Postgres and Postgres doesn't run the best on spinning Rust. And as you can see here, I was having IO weight issues. IO weight is the metric that basically says how or what's the ratio of time that I'm just sitting around waiting for disk. And it was up to four, or close to 40 in this case. And around 6 to 8% is when you notice application performance issues usually. If we scroll down here, we can actually see that it wasn't just a fluke either. So I uh, need to zoom out. I'll go back to the slide for this. Uh, this snapshot here is the same dashboard, just a wider time period. And you can see that it was spiking above the accepted threshold regularly. And the solution for that was separating out the OS and the file storage. So I uh, copied all the files out onto the disk independently, mounted that into the virtual machine separately, and then shrunk the QCOW2 file and put it on MVME storage. And you could see here on the second half of the graph that it uh, IO8 plummeted. And then it was way faster. Something else we're getting into more now is uh, security data. So this is pulling data from the fleet DM API and the uh, query result log. Anybody in here familiar with fleet DM? Uh, it uses OS query, which exposes statistics about your computer, mainly security data, as a in a SQL-like way. And Fleet way where it wraps everything up in a really pretty web GUI. And you can schedule queries, manage a large fleet of devices, run queries against large fleets of devices. And this gathers all of that data and aggregates it here. So we can see which hosts are reporting, uh, what checks they're running, how many policies they're passing and failing. And then down here, we can see what CVEs are vulnerable. This looks really scary, but I actually talked with the fleet people. And there's a, a I'll call it a bug, where they'll, they just check which version of a package you're running and not if it's vendor patched or not. So like if you're running an old, if you're using something like Enterprise Linux or Debian, they'll security patch it, but they won't bump the release number. And it doesn't catch that very well. So I promise I patch my stuff regularly. Don't throw things at me. Here we have the CrowdSec world map. Uh, CrowdSec, a quick summary of it is it's like if fail to ban had a hive mind. And here we can see um, who's trying to attack me, how they're trying to attack me, or what CrowdSec has picked up. And here we can see it's mostly just firewall port scans. I can see that some of them are coming from Russia, uh, but they're mostly coming from the EU and some from the US. You can also see which ASNs they're coming from and the country codes. There's actually a funny story about this. Originally, it was just the world map and the pie chart. And I sent it over to a security engineer I was working with and see, hey, look, I, turned, I made a sim. It has a crappy world graph in it. And he's like, no, you need a bar graph and PDF reports. And at the time, we were using Grafana Cloud. So I added the bar graph. And Grafana Cloud has a reporting plugin where you can email a PDF. So 20 minutes after he said it needed a bar graph and a PDF report, he had it. Last one here is multi-data source. Can anyone tell me where the logs or which panels here are populated from logs and which ones are metrics? Do they look any different? They're all the same. So I believe it's the last four. These are obviously logs, but all the visualizations here are coming from 
Uh, all the metrics are coming from Victoria metrics and all the logs are coming from Loki, but they show up as one unified experience. And this fixes something I call the 20 tabs problem. So during an incident, you'll have like your instant messaging app over here and you have five different people yelling at you, why is all the stuff broken? Why is all the stuff broken? And then you have like your alert manager app open and then your database for looking at metrics and the database for looking at logs open and it's hard to see what's going on because you have so many different or so many different tabs open in your browser and this can help consolidate some of those with people bothering you in an instant messaging app too much, but it can at least make it easier to view all the observability data. So what, shif what doesn't Shiftmon do? Uh, this one is on purpose and it doesn't deploy to alerts automatically. Uh, the thinking behind this is that if I mess up alerting, I could leave a very bad impression on somebody very quickly. If a product to, uh, emailed you 200 times, like 10 minutes after deploying it, you'd be angry and say, this product is garbage, I'm not using it. Um, so that's why I make it something that's manual. It's also highly personable. Different people and even different applications are going to have different thresholds for what's scary. So you might have uh, a Microsoft SQL server and it will use 90% of RAM pretty much all the time because it tries to shove as much stuff in memory as possible. And then you could have a web server fronting that application that barely uses any memory at all and they might need different thresholds. So it's very difficult to come up with a good set of generic rules for everybody. It's also going to be easier to just have people go through the Grafana UI for filling out alerts rather than go through and uh, expose all of that through YAML. Uh, <clears throat> the way we work around this and still keep it easy mode is that we have examples in our documentation for here's how to do the host hasn't reported metrics in five minutes, uh, here's how to detect high memory, high CPU. The other thing about having it be manual is that uh, the user knows where alerts are in Grafana and they have ownership of it. So if it, you fill out an alert and it sends out a bunch of emails to you, you feel more responsible for that and you're not going to blame the product as much. And if you do do that, you probably have a good idea of where the off switch is, whether that's a silence or just uh, changing the alert in general. Another thing that I would like to add is scalable black box monitoring. So this could be implemented with Ansible and Telegraph, but that doesn't have a pretty web GUI experience. Most black box monitoring tools, so like Uptime Robot or Grafana Synthetic Monitoring, have a really good web interface for configuring everything. Um, I looked up using Grafana Synthetic Monitoring, but it looks like you have to authenticate it to Grafana Cloud somehow, and I want everything to be run on premises for this. And most of the existing open source black box monitoring tools like Uptime Kuma, they're great, but they only work in a single location. So it doesn't work for use cases like what's the response time in the US and what's the response time in Europe. Uh, horizontal scaling is another thing that it doesn't do. This was targeted primarily at home labs and small to medium businesses where running in a single virtual machine is fine. And especially if you're running in a high availability virtualization cluster, that's honestly okay for a lot of organizations. And wanting to keep it simple and highly available is really hard to do. Um, and making it highly available raises the bar for who can deploy it. An example of this would be Loki for high availability requires object storage, and I don't have object storage in my home lab. I don't have access to object storage, uh, or I didn't have access to object storage when I was that IT manager. So I'm looking into ways to do this. Another solution to this would be say, hey, there's a bunch of good Helm charts for deploying a similar stack or use Grafana Cloud, and have a way to populate an existing Grafana tenant, uh, or I could bite the bullet and learn how to redo everything I did with Docker and Podman and Kubernetes, but that's really hard. Um, something else I'd like to look into is seam use cases. A lot of the data is already there, so it can consume syslog, it has web server access logs, it can grab data from third party sources. Um, but the issue is, or the other cool thing about this, is I would have one agent for all the security data. So you wouldn't have to 
increment stuff twice. You wouldn't have two agents scraping everything. Um, it would also be one dashboard for both teams. So uh, sysadmin and SRE teams could work together with security engineers much better, and you don't have another tab in your browser you're looking at during an incident. Um, the big hurdle for this is the number of people hours that have been put into Elastic for security. Uh, it's very well known amongst in the security, muni uh, security community. It's industry standard. The other issue I have is access to some of the input data. So having things like proprietary antivirus, so like Sentinel-1, CrowdStrike, those sorts of things, I don't have access to, nor do I want to run them in my house. Um, the other thing is that I can't monitor everything. So along with some proprietary security data, um, I'm not a big Windows user, shockingly enough. I'm at a Linux conference and I don't like using Windows. There's some proprietary firewalls. There's also good tools that I don't use. So TrueNAS is right out there. I'm not a user of TrueNAS. I think it's a great product, but I'm not the right person to instrument TrueNAS because I'm not a user of it. I can make a pretty dashboard out of TrueNAS data probably, really wouldn't be that useful. Um, also, my, uh, hey babe, uh, do you wanna grab the mic quick? Okay, um, my lovely wife and co-owner of Shift System is right there. She says I'm not to, p I am not allowed to have a full server rack in the basement, so I can't do things like a high availability Kubernetes setup, um, or run like a full hashy stack and run Nomad, stuff like that. I'm also not an expert at everything, so even if I did like set up a little TrueNAS box on the Dell Optiplex, that's not gonna reflect the real world. Uh, a good example of that is a couple years ago, I was adding Suricata support for PFSense and I was replaying alerts, so I had volume data. And then when I actually started using it, the volume was completely different. So all the pretty aggregate pie charts and stuff I made were useless because I was only getting a couple alerts every 24 hours and it just made sense to show all the alerts. So how can you help? Um, if you have access to any of those data sources, you're a Kubernetes guru, uh, you're good with TrueNAS, you can contribute to GitLab or join our matrix community and ask for help. Um, the big thing right now is access to data sources and knowledge that I don't have. And if you need uh, assistance with Shiftmon in any way, so implementation, or you need a data source implemented at a pretty quick place, or you have proprietary applications you need instrumented, uh, you can contact sales at shiftsystems.net or message me in Matrix. And a special thanks to my wife, uh, Shelby, who is the co-owner, CFO, COO, and does everything I don't want to do in regards to running a business, and all the upstream projects that do 90% of the work. Questions? No? All right, so I actually, uh, submitted an update to Shiftmon, and I'm going to deploy it right now. So a quick, need to zoom in this tab too, don't I? Um, so here's an inventory for Shiftmon. This is all the infrastructure in my home lab. Um, requirements at AML. And here's the playbook for running Shiftmon. So this up here is pretty much just looking for environment variables that are set up through Woodpecker CI um, to grab secrets and grab certificates. Yep, I'm getting there. Um, you boring text file stuff, but basically it's grabbing everything from Ansible Galaxy and deploying. And then when I want to deploy, I go to Woodpecker, run pipeline. I have a security of scopes. Ah. So we're in a kick scan to make sure I'm not putting secrets in version control or anything like that. And Ansible Lint to make sure everything looks good. This takes a few minutes, so any questions, comments? Dashboards you want to see?
back there. This is their switch. I can just repeat it. Okay. Oh, there we go. Hi. Uh, you mentioned this was like a, I guess, like a company or a business. So I was wondering, like, is there like a price tier or price plan for these? Or is it like just available? We don't do hosted solution. It's purely just consulting for uh, monetization. What? Um, yeah, but this would be like private hosting in your own data center. Would it be something that we host cloud-based right now? If it is on the website, I have some work to do when I get home. Thank you. Okay, good. It is up to date. Okay, so you mentioned a lot about like how you monitor and all that stuff. Um, how does all your data like do you keep it on disk, on SSD, and like how's that set up? It is all using block storage right now. Um, so, do I have my keys up here? Nope. Um, so everything is in opt shift mod. Oh. Um, there. So all of the Loki data goes in op shift mom Loki, and then Victoria metrics is Victoria metric storage, and the config is stored in the Victoria metrics folder. So it just plops everything to files on disk. Are, are those SSDs? Uh, in my house, yes. Okay. This would probably run very poorly on a hard drive due to the fact that it's constantly writing data. I haven't tested that, though. I think it would depend on how many systems you connect to. Uh, Slew said it's probably dependent on how much infrastructure you're monitoring. Um, bam. So we're through to restarting Shiftmon. Sometimes it says it fails even though it works. But once it, once this job finishes here, you should be happy. This is the dramatic pause part. And then once it runs through Telegraph, it should explain everything else as well. Any, oh, it failed, but it failed successfully. Yay, it failed successfully. So we can reload the page, show all the dashboards. Um, yeah, so usually the... So it's Sleuth is saying sometimes this part right here where the service restarts fails, it might just be because it took too long to respond. So the service just runs a bash script that says, hey, tear down all the containers and then spin them back up again. But sometimes I think it's the Grafana on-call stuff that makes it run forever um, in my case. But So here we can see the Telegraph role running and Here's the boring part where it just is like, is it Debian or is it Red Hat? Add the appropriate signing key. Make sure Telegraph is installed. And then here's the downloading the base config. And then the smarts begin here. It's detecting what systemd units are present. And it's checking, hey, is mesh, mesh central set up? Is CrowdSec there? Is AdGuard there? Stuff like that. And it even does a check for bare metal for gathering smart data. So, yeah. I don't have anything else, but I still have a ton of time. Is there a dashboard someone wants to see? Questions? What's Mesh Central? Mesh Central is an open source uh, remote access tool similar to something like TeamViewer or Screen Connect. So you can run scripts against a set of devices 
or remotely access a uh, device remotely. I use it a ton for tech support, for helping like parents, family, that sort of stuff. And then everything actually is happy now. So, um, uh, what what exactly does Telegraph do? It's a little unclear to me. What, what so it plays. Telegraph is the collection agent. So instead of running the same agent uh, for like Zabbix, where the Zabbix pro there's the Zabbix client and the Zabbix server, this Telegraph is sending data to Victoria Metrics and Loki. So all it's doing is collecting things like how hard is the CPU running, tailing a file, stuff like that, and then it'll route the results to the appropriate database. Oh, so all, all the logs and all the metrics, they all go through Telegraph. Yep. Okay. Telegraph. All right. Again, if you want to use Prometheus or Graphite to send data, it's fine, and you'll just have to ignore all the pre canned dashboards because they won't work. Sorry, so is, is Telegraph a timescale DB? Uh, no, Telegraph is just a collection agent. So Telegraph is really cool because it's not tied to any one vendor. Um, I'll pull up their GitHub just to kind of go through the whole scale. Uh, yeah, that's what we're wondering. Oh, it, so it sends metric data using the InfluxDB protocol to Victoria metrics. So Victoria metrics, pretends like it's the InfluxDB v1 API and receives the data and then it's queried as if it was Prometheus. And that's kind of the cool thing is that I, this tool used to be based on InfluxDB, but I had issues with cardinality and logs. And separating out the two databases helped resolve that issue because Loki handles that much better than Influx did and still does if you're using OSS. Uh, do you have any solutions for like backups? Um, right now, I rely on virtual machine backups for that. Um, I actually write a tool that will backup libvirt um, called Pango Backup. Basically, it'll take a snapshot of the machine, an external snapshot, and write all data while it's being backed up to a separate QCOW2 and then merge the two later. Um, it has worked restoring from backup because during development, I have curdled things pretty badly before. So I would just back up the virtual machine. And I think the issue with backing up Victoria Metrics is, is VM backup is an enterprise product. So cool. Um, so back to God, there's a lot of input plugins. So these are all the inputs that Telegraph can support. Not all of these are supported. So, oh, yep. So there's like, I think it's over 200 now. I have to scroll for a long time just to get through all of the things that Telegraph can monitor and that users can instrument themselves. We only instrument like the 10 or so applications that are uh, in our documentation. So everything from like OpenStack and Suricata to just tailing a file or Prometheus checks. So if somebody wanted to monitor an application that you don't support, how would they go about doing that? Um, <laughs> so uh, are you talking about, we'll use the crypto dashboard because there's no personal data that I'll accidentally show on the internet. Um, LA, Etsy, Telegraph, Telegraph.d. So the config structure is similar to like Apache or Nginx where there's a main config and then a Telegraph.d directory where your users can store custom config, the stonk. Yep. So <laughs> um, we can just cut out the file here if I can type. Uh, so this is an input here, which is saying, hey, look, uh, make an HTTP request and use the JSON v2 data format. Here's the CoinGecko URL to grab the data from and uh, a query to filter it out a bit and then rename the data so it doesn't have certain special characters that it doesn't handle. And then here's the output plugin for InfluxDB. 
answer your question? So that's how to get the data in, but what if you want to visualize it? If you want to visualize in a dashboard. Yep. So if you wanted to visualize it, uh, let's go to dashboards. And then you would go to create a new dashboard here, add a visualization, select your data source, and then it has this really awesome, you could write out the PromQL queries yourself, or it has a really nice WYSIWYG editor where I can go price, let's do Bitcoin. It'll show the data there. And then if you want to change the visualization type, this is everything in a default Grafana instance. So we can just have a gauge. Uh, oh, on the time series. Why do you want to make me feel bad about losing money on crypto? <laughs> oh. uh, Twenty-four hours. Let's do something more volatile. That's not a bad one to do. Um, Donk. Oh, that was the Bitcoin price in Bitcoin. That's why it was just one. That looks much better. It's how I get the data from the API, basically. So I tell it to price it in USD and in BTC. But yeah. And again, I redeployed it. The dashboard is still there for, let's expand the general folder. Um, everything is still there in my custom folder that nobody else, or that I have all my data for like Gitty and NTOPNG. Yep, if you put anything in the shift mom folder, it will probably get overridden by automation. It's not polite and is like, hey, you put something here. It'll just be like, nope, this is my folder. Grafana doesn't let you save in that folder. Yep, uh, you can do that. You can allow it to, but that would be a bad idea on my part because then when you redeployed it, the old dashboard would crop back up. If you did want to say, hey, I like this Docker dashboard a lot, um, it'll be like, oh, hey, you made change it, or let's actually make a change. So let's say I want to make this one a gauge, hit apply, here, edit, make it a gauge, apply. When we go to save the dashboard, It'll be, this was set up through the provisioning API, here's the documentation. And then it'll give you the really big JSON blob. You can copy it to a clipboard or save it to a file. You can go to dashboards, discard, um, new, import, copy in the JSON load it, it'll get mad that it has a duplicate name, so we'll call it the cooler docker. Put it in the general folder, change the UID. And now we have the gauge folder again. Oh, yeah, so toggling through devices here, you can go through your different container hosts. So this is my uh, Woodpecker CI instance. It pulls in a bunch of different containers. Um, my main hypervisor also runs some containers as well, and the fuzzy of the day bot, which just sends a dog picture to a chat room every day. It doesn't support multi-select for some of these, which kind of stinks, but... Uh, can't do in top ng. So if you do have multiple instances of something again, you can go through and oh, I need to fix that host apparent. I need to fix a lot of these hosts apparently. 
Zeke and Armin are instrumented properly, though. So if you do need to go through separate hosts, you just go through the host variable and go through here. Anything else? Cool. Um, thanks for letting me talk. Um, again, we have business cards and cool pangolin stickers up there. So yeah, I'm going to shut off the mic now and unplug my laptop. <laughs>